Hello, my dear. This is Sherry Hayes, the homeschooling mom of 15, bringing you encouragement and delight for your day. So, wash the dishes, fold the laundry, nurse the baby, or just sit and sip some tea while we dive into the good life in Jesus. And the good life in Jesus includes as we are homemaking and homeschooling. Today, we are going to examine narration, which is a very Charlotte Mason-ish thing to do, don't you think, to examine something? <laughs> Except, especially examining something such as narration. Now, I first discovered Charlotte Mason after I'd been officially homeschooling for about six years. I think it was like 1995. And it was a rediscovery for all of us at that time. It was brought to our attention by persons such as Susan Schaefer Macaulay, who has written the book For the Children's Sake. If you've never written that book, it is worth your time. So just, just you know, look it up at the library. It probably has, your, your local library probably has it. Um, and also Karen Andreola, she wrote the book um, The Charlotte Mason Companion. And that, I mean, I'm telling you what, that is so chock full of information and encouragement. It's really cool. She's on Instagram, by the way, if you want to follow her. And, and, you know, she's older and she talks a lot about mother culture. It's really cool. Okay. Now I learned of it via some magazine articles back then and some email chats. Now back then the internet was very limited. And if other ladies, we wanted to have like conversations, we were, we could only have like so many hours, I forget, like a week or a month or something like that. And we had to use the phone line. So it tied up the phone line. So what we would do is we would have these email lists and we would download them and then we would get offline and then we would read them and then we'd comment, we get back online and comment and stuff. So I learned about Charlotte Mason, the method via that kind of a thing. So it was kind of choppy and intermittent, but Anyway, when I first heard about it, I was using boxed curriculum and I had one son in, in particular that he was very o obedient to me and he would have done anything I asked him to do and he was super intelligent, but he just, I mean, I gave him these workbook pages and he would fill in all the little slots and everything and it just, he would have put his, uh, held his little head in his hand and it just looked like he was just really bored out of his mind. <laughs> so when I, I just didn't have the confidence to feel like I could bust away from curriculum and do my own thing. I mean, it kind of freaked me out. Um, there was something called design a study that I bought her guides and it kind of was giving me a different picture. And then Karen Andriola, Susan Schaefer Macaulay, just kind of, but I didn't know what to do kind of. So I had a a biography of Lafayette. You know, Lafayette was the fellow that helped George Washington in the Revolutionary War. And it was a children's biography. And I gave that to my son. And I said, honey, you're not going to do these workbook pages anymore. You just take this book. And here's a Red Chief uh, notepad. <laughs> you know, those big, the big red ones. I don't know if they sell them anymore even, but it used to be a big thing. I gave him a Red Chief notepad and I gave him a pencil and I said, just read a chapter and then write about it. And I said, that's all you have to do. And like he had stars in his eyes, like really? This is all I have to do. It just restored the love of learning for him. So it was a breath of fresh air in our homeschooling. So anyway, what is narration anyway? People want to know because that's kind of a vague thing to say. Oh, you know, you just do Charlotte Mason narration. And everybody goes, uh, what in the world are you talking about? <clears throat> Basically narrating it the way Charlotte Mason talked about it. It was telling back what the child just heard or read. So she had this to say, let him read to a child of any age from six to 10, an account of an incident graphically and tersely told. And the child will relate what he has heard point by point, though not word for word, and will add delightful original touches. What is more, he will relate the passage months later because he has visualized the scene and appropriated that bit of knowledge. So when you look up the definition in the dictionary, to narrate means simply to tell a story. Like if you're watching a movie and in between the action, someone will be telling like different things that happened and you know, bring you up to snuff on what's happening in between the action scenes, that's called narration, right? So a narrative is simply a recounting of what has occurred, okay? So you could say that like the history books of the Bible are narratives, right? 
Um, if you if you went to the store and you're relating what happened to you at the store to someone, that's a narrative. So narration and narration is something we use all the time. We just don't realize it. It's a very natural way that human beings speak and communicate with each other. So when we think of narration with homeschooling, you, well, we'll talk about it more, but you don't have to just do it with a book and a chapter, right? <laughs> you don't. Okay, so, so what is narration for anyway? Narration is for increasing comprehension so that a child can have a better understanding. The comprehension is one of the major things that teachers have trouble with in schools, is that kids can read a passage, but they don't understand what they're reading. They can't recall it. They can't take information from it. If you get children practicing narration, it'll just come naturally. Okay, it increases memory. So a person is able to recall details and information. It increases engagement, okay? If you, it, your child turns from being just a spectator or a consumer of knowledge, they make it their own and then they're able to be involved in whatever has been read or, or um, what they're reading. And it adds an enjoyment. It brings meaning and delight and application from each reading. So that's important. Now, it's what its purpose is not. It's not as like a test to check up on the child to see if they really, you know, I mean, I know that sometimes we need to do that too, but that's not really the main focus of a narration. And when I first came to narration, um, doing oral narrations especially, I kind of came at it from the viewpoint, the schoolish kind of an idea, that I wanted to make sure that child was doing it correctly and that, you know, they had to have every detail correct, you know, and it was just a pressure, nasty, horrible thing. <laughs> okay. But no, um, that's that's really not what narration is in the heart of it. And, and you know, I've actually... Um, read different accounts of people that, you know, in different um, Charlotte Mason schools and how they went about narration. And I don't know, I think it turned into something more schoolish and robotic. I don't think it has to be that way. And especially since in homeschooling, we have such a personal relationship with the child who's doing the narrations that actually we can open it up and we can make it more of like a literary discussion. And then we can also go off on rabbit trails if we want to. So then it becomes like a whole discussion where we're pulling and it becomes a discipleship session. I mean, there's just so much that's added to it. So, um, and also if you're expecting your child to know how to narrate without examples or prompts, it turns into a horrible situation. Like, okay, okay. So tell me what happened in the story. You've got to give me a narration. So I'll go ahead. And they go, I don't know where to start. And that happens a lot. You know, I, and so you have to kind of like, you might try to give your own example of a narration and say, well, when I read this story, this is how I would narrate it back. And you give an example. This is what I would say. I would say this happened first, this happened second, and this happened like that, you know, or, um, you know, like if they're doing a narration and they don't even know where to start, you, you can give them starts and also don't correct everything they say. There's nothing more discouraging in an oral narration, if the, the child's starting to narrate and you're correcting every little bit and every little thought, you know, I mean, we have to keep them on track sometimes, but we can be too critical and we can just kind of kill it. And so they won't want to t tell us, they won't want to talk anymore. <laughs> okay, here's some things that we can do really right about doing narrations. First, give, like I said, give your child an example of a narration, okay? Take a movie you both like and tell it back to him and allow him to correct you when you get the details wrong. That's always fun. While narrating, if your child gets stuck, ask some questions. You know, um, like they might be telling, like if they were telling the story of the, the, billy, the three billy goats scruff, and they forget a part, and if they kind of get stuck, you go, and then he, then he jump, or then the he clump, oh yeah, I remember now, so that, you know, it'll work. Okay, um, while narrating, it, okay, Turn it into more of a discussion, like I talked about, like on the setting, the technique of the writer, the different characters, the message, um, how this related to another book you may have read. And on like that, you can also draw a narration. Now, I use this a lot in my uh, the lesson book series. I have a series of lesson books that I tailored pretty much for the McGuffey readers, but you could use it for any book that you're reading. And, and for the younger set, for the different levels, the lower levels actually have places 
to write a word and draw about it. And so these are places and for the narration part of it, they draw. And so you can use that and you can have a child. They don't have to draw like a, they can do it like a comic book. They can do one, two, three, four different drawings. And then you can write the captions or they can write the captions or they can just do one drawing that shows one scene. And it just shows that they have taken that story into themselves and they understand it and they're relating it back. It doesn't have to be really involved, right? So um, if you have a child who is reluctant to talk and they're especially boys at a certain point, they just don't like to talk a lot, right? Start by having him play a thumbs up or down game, okay, with the characters or the events. In other words, you say, so I'm going to mention uh, a place or an event or a person and you tell me if you if it gets a thumbs up or a thumbs down and so he'll go so you say okay like like in the three billy goats graph say the troll and he'll give thumbs down or he might like trolls <laughs> he might thumbs up and you'll say so why do you like that troll and then you're asking an open-ended question you say why do you like him and he'll say because he growled a lot you know or whatever or um like he might like the little billy goat and say Oh, little billy goat, big bi medium billy goat, and big billy goat. And have him tell whether he gets thumbs up or thumbs down for each one. And then ask him why. Now he's discussing it. You're kind of pulling things out of him. He's realizing that he can verbalize the thoughts he has in his head. And you can do that with, you know, just about anything. Okay, if you have a number of children. Okay, here's some tips for that. Um, and you think, wow, I have five children that I'm homeschooling. How am I going to do narration after we've read something? Well, this is what I, that's the question I had. <laughs> like, how do you homeschool? How do you do a narration with five children on the same story at different stages and different ages? So what I would do is I would have the littlest one start first. And they would kind of give some different things. And, and I would just like anything they told me. I did not say it was right or wrong. I'd say, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's an important point. Okay, very good job. And then we were done. And I might even take a couple sentences for them or something. And then we would go to the next person up. And I'd say, either I'd say, well, you can start from the beginning. Or I can say, do you have anything to add? And I know it's technically not the exact correct thing, but... Um, it was really good because it caused it caused also the other older children to have patience and to have understanding for the little kids. And oftentimes when the little kids did it first, we'd all have something to kind of make us giggle, you know, <laughs> the cute things they would say. But then we learned patience and we learned understanding. And the older kids then, sometimes when it was their turn, then the basic facts had already been done so that they could delve in, so they could delve in more into the the more uh, spiritual or uh, emotional or uh, philosophical side of a story or, or like an application of its meaning. So it kind of helped everybody doing it that way. Okay, um, then uh, for kinesthetic learners, okay, if you have some kids that like they're really antsy and they already heard the story, now they got to move, what you can do is you could lay a strip of tape on the floor and you can put uh, crosswise like ticks on the tape with, with with little pieces of tape in different intervals, like a couple feet apart. And you could have the child say, we're going to do this story. And on each little, then you take a step. You first we're going to start at the beginning of the tape. Then you take, you tell what's the beginning. And then you step on the next piece of tape and you tell me what happened and like that so that their body is moving while they're talking and they can just kind of hop from place to place and it helps them kind of keep their body moving with their mind moving if that makes sense so it just gives them an understanding of how stories work and how to move along okay and also if you begin early with your kids you will have children who enjoy reading and your discussions on reading aloud will become more and more enriched as your family grows it'll just become just better and better and we notice this with our family. Um, I only have two children that I'm actively um, homeschooling. But even the, the children that have grown up and come home, we have these discussions all the time. These big, lengthy, long discussions on like a movie they've watched or a book they've read or something. Because we're used to doing that with each other. It's become like a family a hallmark of our family it's like a family like some families they get together they might do i don't know what they do but play video game i don't know i'm not saying that's bad or good or whatever but in our family 
like we'll eat a meal and we'll sit and we'll just talk and we'll discuss things and it's just really a lot of fun so this is something very important that will help you too because you might have like a six or seven year old and maybe or maybe four year old whatever and you're thinking how in the world am I going to get this child to write a write a narration and you don't have to <laughs> Wait till your child is like nine or ten to have them write them. And tell them, have them do all of their narr narrations orally or with a drawing. You do not have to do the lengthy, long, drawn out writing. You know, it's like I have a 14 year old daughter. She's just now writing longer <laughs> narrations. She's a talker in her, her language. She likes to talk, talk, talk about everything, but she doesn't have to write, right? And I know you have some like that. So what you do is you don't force them to to write it out until they get better at writing, you know, in general, right? So anyway, and they do develop better writing skills as they do the narrations. So it's, and it's, it's a gradual thing. It's not like, okay, so we did narrations for a whole month. How come they're not writing, you know, 10 pages? <laughs> no. It's a gradual little thing and it, it doesn't seem like much when they're just writing two sentences and then they go to three sentences and then they go to a paragraph, then they go to two paragraphs and then they're going to a whole page. Okay. I know it doesn't seem, you know, it's these little tiny incremental things, but it does add up over the years. Okay. And it really does pay off in the end. Now I use the McGuffey's, uh, for all this. Like, okay, so I read aloud to my kids, but I also use the McGuffey readers. So they read on their own and then they narrate their, their stuff, you know, with either a drawing or with a sentence or two or, you know, however, wherever they are at. Now, um, so I have lesson books set up for that. I also have free lesson sheets on momdelights.com. I think they're in my freebies section. And so, um, you know, I have, I have done this for so long that, our family they just expect it. Everybody, even little kids, they totally understand it. If this is new to you, you can use my lesson sheets or my lesson books and it will just really help you to have like a space and a place. It'll help because we're all used to that. Um, I know I was, I, I still am in some ways used to having education fit into little boxes, you know? And so <laughs> if you use my lesson books, it'll really help. But in, eventually, uh, you can use the same strategy. Now we're talking primarily about stories, right? Accounts, narratives, but you can use it for informational reading uh, as well. Like if you're reading about, you know, apes in, uh, in, de in the highlands or whatever, you can take that informational reading and you can turn that into a, uh, a telling back, right? Everybody, you read it to them, they tell back these different information things, right? And you can train a child to narrate an article about snails, for instance, and he will be able to tell back what he has read and also write what he has read. And this is actually an informal essay. People ask me, how do you teach your kids to write essays? Well, this is how, right? At some point, you teach them the most basic essay format, which is a thesis statement, a thesis paragraph, a three points, three paragraphs, each based on the three points in the essay, uh, the, in the thesis um, paragraph, and then a conclusion paragraph, right? That's just your basic essay outline. But this is when you can give your child a subject or a thesis statement and have him do some research and write an original essay. That does eventually happen. But at first, it's just a telling back. So, um, I hope that this has given you some good ideas uh, about narration and um, you know uh, let me know I'm going to have this on YouTube as well as Spotify and iTunes and all that um, you know I also will be putting this these notes on this podcast on my blog momdelights.com and you can leave a comment there if you have further questions about narration or other Charlotte Mason topics that we can cover. So with that, I would like to give you something more. So sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes we will have an uproar in our house and people will just be upset with each other. I don't know if you've, you've ever experienced this, but some days it seems like just something is off and everybody is getting upset. 
and you're upset with your husband, your husband's upset with you, the kids are upset, and it's just a big, bad, awful thing. And there are lots of reasons for that. Sometimes people are ill. Sometimes there's a change in weather. Maybe you've been going through a time of stress. And so I don't want to narrow it down just to one little thing. But sometimes there is a spiritual element that needs to be taken care of in a family. And I want to read to you James uh, chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, through 18. Okay. Who is wise, and this is, by the way, this is in New King James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct what his works are done in the weakness, meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of the righteous and the fruit now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And so specifically in this passage, I would like to concentrate on verse uh, 16. So let me read that again. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. And that word self-seeking is also understood to be strife. Okay. Now, what's interesting here is that confusion and evil can be brought into our homes if we have allowed envy and strife to enter. Now, this envy could be amongst each other, or it could be about people outside the house. The strife, basically, to be uh, to have strife means that you are trying to take care of yourself and your stuff and what you need and what you want, right? And so lots of times, I hate to say it, but lots of times this strife and this uh, contention and this envy can start at the top with the mom and dad and then trickle down. Now, I will confess on myself at times, um, I will be working my little fanny to the bone and I'll look over and my husband has been resting. Now, he has been working his fanny to the bone too, but he's just resting right now <laughs> when I'm working. And so I will be envious of him that he is resting and I just need to rest. And why is he resting and I'm not? Now, that's a point of envy we don't often think about, is it? <laughs> Envying someone resting when we wish we would rest. <laughs> but that envy right there is an entrance for the devil then to have a foothold. And then you are inviting confusion and evil into your home. Now, maybe it's your husband envying or being striving or whatever, but I'm not responsible for that. What you can do is if someone higher than you is having envy or strife, then you can nip that thing in the bud. What the Bible says, not returning evil with evil, but with a blessing instead. Okay, and so that's how you can nip this thing in the butt and you can stop it. So lots of times what will happen, there will be some confusion, some strife, some, some, it's just like an evil atmosphere. What I will do is I will take the fruits of the Spirit and I will pray those fruits of the Spirit out loud. Sometimes if there's been a lot of strife and confusion, I'll grab my kids or in my husband sometimes will do this and we'll get in a, a circle and we'll just start speaking out the fruits of the Spirit. Love. Lord, we ask you to, we love your, we love you, Lord. We love your Spirit. We ask you to bring the fruits of the Spirit in our home right now. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in the name of Jesus. And we'll just speak those fruits. And, you know, we tried it, like I did it really quickly. But we'll try to say those really slow. Love. And we'll think about love. Joy peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith-filledness, gentleness, and self-control. And you know what? 
we have prayed that and seen that like that spiritual atmosphere that's dark and evil it'll just poof it'll go away because as we practice those fruits and we we actually are allowing god to well those up inside of us right then what happens is we are dissipating the darkness and the other things and you know you can't be full of envy and strife if you're concentrating on the fruits right and we will speak that and like like i'll have like um i'll see two people are about to go at it like a teen and a and an adult or uh you know dad and one of the teens or something like that and i'll just see that it's bubbling up and i will just pray under my breath i'll just start speaking that and you know what it's just amazing it's like the sky clears and in just a few minutes you're saying well i didn't mean to say that i'm sorry dad oh i'm sorry son i know i just misunderstood you and poof it's gone <laughs> so I hope that is something you can use okay and so the next time that things are starting to brew just do the fruits of the spirit and uh yeah and and confess your sins one to another that you may be healed right so I am so thankful that you have listened to me today I hope you got some stuff done I hope this blessed you and if you could um, you know, on YouTube, you can like and subscribe and all that. And um, if you could leave a good review on iTunes for this, and you can also go to my blog and you can receive my blog posts via email and you'll get the podcast notes and you'll know when another podcast comes out because I don't know how to keep track of this myself. I don't know if you do. Like I'm on Spotify. We have Spotify premium. So I do catch this stuff on there, but sometimes I miss it. So you know, if you'll share with a friend or what have you, if this has blessed you. And, you know, I am I have lots of freebie stuff that you can have, too, from my blog. And I love giving free stuff away. So I'll probably have some more stuff in the future. I'm planning on doing an ancient Greece thing pretty soon, I think. So anyway, I hope this blesses you. I hope you have a wonderful day. And bye-bye.